My name is Predrag Cvetičen and I was the coordinator of the research activities and I will present something which looks like a prologue in a theater play. So I won't speak about substantive results, my colleagues will do this. I will speak mostly about what we wanted to achieve and how we tried to achieve. So it's about theory, methodology <coughs> and this sort of stuff. Uh, our research or e idea for our research basically starts with two anecdotes. One of them is from a scientific conference from one of the countries in the region and one of the presenters who works for the government <coughs> he said that in order to show that uh, this country is uh, progressing in their European path they produce laws which are in line with Aki Communitaire so very much looks like laws in other European countries but from the very beginning they know that they cannot apply these laws and he said the crucial sentence that paradoxically instead of gap between real life and legal systems closing down the gap between what is real and what is legal is widening up so this is one of the points few years before the project and the second one is an anecdote about an old lady who lived in split all her life she didn't like to travel in fact she didn't even like to go out of her house but instead of in spite of this she lived in seven different states when she was born split is was split was in austro-hungarian empire then after that it was in kingdom of serbs croats and slovenes then in kingdom of yugoslavia then in italy then in independent state of croatia then in socialist yugoslavia and finally in today's croatia and different political systems different constitutions different political actors and very important huge social projects during one's life so after first world war an attempt to build a modern bourgeois society after second world war an attempt to build a socialist society after wars in the Balkans, an attempt to do a modern society or contemporary transitional society. And people were, during their lifetimes, faced that these huge projects failed. So they developed, rely, they started relying on informal ways, which for them are at least stable and they developed something which our colleague Klaus said Lenix called buffer culture so they don't trust these projects they rely on ways to do things their own way so in spite of these two anecdotes the rest of the projects were hard work it was hard work it was not an anecdote it's it was more than 30 months of hard work so we have another attempt to change these societies. It's linked to European integration. And as Eric mentioned, we have a gap between laws, new procedures, what is de jure and what is de facto. And we wanted to learn bottom up, do these new rules really change practices? Is life changed during these procedures, during these processes? Not whether they change just laws and the question was to what extent this harmonization and transposition of EU <coughs> rules and regulations within a national legal political and economic system lead to substantive changes in practices or whether these just remain empty shells we are during the project we realized that basically we are dealing with invisible part invisible parts of the icebergs in two senses uh, Brie and Stolting say that, that the mainstream of scholarly research almost exclusively aimed of 10 percent of the visible tip of the iceberg of the social processes although it is widely known that 90 percent in social life is basically informal and the second thing what we learned during the project that most studies on europeization stay on the level of government did government 
produce a law, did government establish a body, and after that, nothing, a black box. So our project is basically about European integration on the societal, societal level. What is going on on the level of society? Not what governments are doing, but are there changing at the changes at the social level? And that, that's why it's bottom up. We are basically studying, starting from everyday life and then building up. Very early, we realized that most of these studies dealing with Europeanization processes are basically studying which measures do work and which measures don't work, and why these measures don't work. Instead, we started with what works in these societies and how. And it proved to be a very useful approach. The problem with studying informality is that it's Janus-based. You see both faces of, of informality. <coughs> on one hand, it's a, it appears like a solidarity. On the other hand, it's a cancer which destroys Dick societies. It's both. It's ambivalent, it's fluent. In interpretation of informality, you have to see that it's always context-bound. It's context-related. If you want to interpret informality, you have to know the context in which it happens. On the other hand, there is something which I consider to be uh, ambivalence power greed. More powerful actors are, less ambivalent their informality is. There are many cases in which it's obvious corruption but you cannot do anything about it. So if actors are not powerful, <coughs> level of ambivalence rises. When it concerns our theoretical framework, we basically rely on two types of theories, two groups of theories. One of them is called new institutionalism. People like Douglas North, Paul DiMaggio, Marsha Olson, Helm Kelevitsky, and so on. And the other group of theories called theories of practice. Both groups of theories are reaction to behaviorism in social sciences. And both groups of theories are claiming that you cannot study social processes starting from the level of individual <coughs> behavior. Social processes don't belong, don't rely, and don't, are, are not caused only by individual actions. New institutionalism basically claim that there is a powerful role that rules play in society, that they provide a certain level of certainty, stability, predictability in social behavior, and also that institutions help you to analyze and orient in social actions. What new institutionalism brought with it is that institutions are rules. All the institutionalism treated institutions as players, as organizations. In new institutionalism, we have institutions and rules. And famously, North claims that there are formal rules and there are informal rules, like in sports. There are rules which everybody knows and have to respect. You have to play by rules when you play football, but it's also important not to hurt a f opponent's player. So there are informal rules how to play the game. But if you are interested not in how rules infect uh, what players do, but if you're interested in what players are doing, then you're basically interested in practices because the goal of the play is not to follow the rule. The goal of the play is to win. And then we realize while speaking to people that it is not just the case that they follow informal rules, contrary to formal rules, but in fact they manipulate both formal and informal rules in order to achieve their goals. Sometimes they rely on formal rules, <coughs> in order to punish their enemies. Sometimes they rely on informal rules 
in order to provide benefits for their friends. Sometimes they manipulate both. But practices are not individual practices. When theory of practice, exemplified like people uh, by Pierre Bourdieu, Michel Deserto, Charles Taylor, Theodor Schatzky and so on, practices are collective social practices, like using Veze, Vrsky, Stella. This is not individual thing. This is collective way of doing things. And there is internal logic, but it's not a rule. You need to feel, you need to have a feel for the game. In order to play these things rightly, you know, to, you should know how to do these things. And this is what theories of practice basically studies. Practices are collective and practice is also improvisational. So we slowly move from new institutionalism to theories of practice during our research. And we try to operationalize these theories. And very early in our project, we produced something which we internally called inform mandala. So it's a heuristic device in which almost all factors, all, all factors that we studied were presented. So I will try to explain how we did it. In terms of formal and informal rules, we studied formal rules. In case of European integration, they very much rely on acquis communitaire, a legal thing of European Union. But also there are informal rules on the other hand. But Probably one of the starting points of our research is the insight that rules don't immediately, after they are proclaimed, they don't affect behavior. In order to become effective, they <coughs> have to become a formal or informal <coughs> constraint. And they become constraints when they pass through something which we call enforcement and habituation belt. You need to interpret these rules. You need to have sanctions if you want to apply these rules. And you need the process of routinization. Once a rule goes through all these phases, if people are aware of the rule, if people are aware that there are sanctions, if you break the rule, if people routinize their activities in everyday life, then it becomes a constraint. So, we faced the implementation gap and we very much focused on enforcement belt, how it functions in our societies. But practices are not just rule governed. There are people who don't have resources to follow rules. They would like to pay the bills for electricity, for heating. They are really moral, but they don't have resources. Mm -hmm. There are others who are so powerful that they don't have to pay for electricity and heating. There are powerful cliques who can do almost everything and you cannot do anything about it. So practices are very much influenced by resources which are at your dis or somebody's disposal. Plus you have influences from other fields, especially from the political field. What we realize and we we will speak about during the day, that there are many instances which cause informality in our states, but probably one of the most important ones are captured states, or we even call them captured societies. That there are groups whose rule basically uh, depends on <coughs> informal ways. Otherwise, their rule won't continue. So they are not ready to give up in formal ways. All other layers of society very likely just copy these models. But in studying these processes, in studying practices, we are basically doing the other way around. So we started always with 
really detailed description of practices with thick description of practices, how people take care of their health, how they educate themselves and their kids, how they find jobs, <coughs> how parties organize life in local communities. Then second step was to locate reasons or motives that people claim these are the reasons why we are doing this. And we realize that there are four different types of reasons, like perceptions. Everybody is doing this, so I have to do this. Otherwise, I won't be able to cope. Then there are interests, both material and symbolic. Then there are certain value orientations. Somebody claims, I, I will never do this. It's against my morals. We will all die, but I will never do it. And there are certain needs. So these are starting from practices, then individual motives and reasons. From there, we go to study constraints, formal constraints and informal constraints. Going further up, we studied in for how enforcement belt works, how processes of interpretation, sanctions, routinization work. Finally, we go to the level of formal rules and informal rules. At the end, resources and influences from other fields. But in order to do this, you need enormous amount of data. And this is what we did. We have enormous amount of data. We surveyed 6,040 people. We did 250 interviews. We conducted 1,095 hours of ethnographic work. We did plenty of secondary data analysis. We did analysis of legal documents and media reports. So the database is something that most of the people in the region can work for next 50 years. And I'm not sure that European Commission will allow us <laughs> such a long period. So this is it. Thank you very much.